Welcome in to another edition of Kicking It. Call me Ishmael. We got a white whale here. This is what... Uh, I'm not following that. It's a Moby Dick reference. Literary yeah. classics. The first line of Moby Dick was call me Ishmael. Yeah, so it's re Moby Dick is used after... A... Anyway, Steel Jance is going to be a guest today. Who? So, Steel. Uh, he is sort of the, in, the enigmatic former quarterback who is just a delight to talk to. Uh, we just got done with, we recorded the interview first, we're doing this interview, this little kind of intro afterwards. He's just so much fun. Like he's, he's the great thing about steel doesn't give a rip what anybody thinks about him and just does the things that he likes to do. And that's the how way life he likes to do it. And like, that's how life should be. It is inspiring to you to, or at least to me to like, who cares what people think that just God loves steel. Yeah. You know, he's just, he, he has always just danced to the beat of his own drum. That's what I love about steel is that, you know, he, uh, like you said, he doesn't care. He just he is who he is. And yeah, love or leave it. He doesn't care. He's gonna he's gonna be him. All right. Without any more preamble, the Goldfinch Athletics interview of the week, of the year. Steel Jance. And now we welcome in the man, the myth, the legend, Steel Jance. Steel, how you doing? Doing great, man. Hey, we appreciate you hopping on with us. Uh like I said, I, I sent out a, a Twitter poll at the question said, Who do you guys want? Who the listeners want on, and your name got brought up a bunch. So the listeners want to know what has Steel Jance been up to? Where, where are you living? What are you doing? Give us a behind the curtains look. Yeah. So, well, because I did one a couple years ago, it, it's a similar situation where I'm still living in the same town. Um, but yeah, I'm just running the tow company. Um, recently, just had my first daughter. Hey, congratulations. Congrats. Same. Yeah, yeah. How old is she? Uh, five days. Five days. Like Holy shit, that. you're okay. new new. Yeah, wow. Hey, you're in for some diapers, man. Yeah, so I've been doing a lot of uh, laundry and dishes yep. and stuff. Yeah, yep. you're the... Uh... actually harder than the towing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, have you found that you get nothing done? That like the amount of things that you have on your to-do list, it might be like 12 items long of like professional things that you need to get done, like this account yeah. or this follow-up or whatever. You get four of them done when like three weeks ago you would get all 12 done by lunch. Like that, yeah. I feel like that's the biggest difference between having a kid and not having a kid is that yeah. this amount of shit that you get done outside of taking care of the kid. So small, very, yeah. very small. Yeah. Like what I've noticed is like, instead of like task completion, now I'm just, just never stop moving and just keep doing stuff. Cause I'm not going to finish any tasks. So it's <laughs> kind of like, don't worry about it. And as soon as I clean the kitchen, it's dirty again. Uh -huh. And as soon as you take the laundry out of the dryer, there's like more coming in and uh -huh. And then trying to do the business at the same time. So, but I've, I've kind of uh, adapted quickly to just the, the flow of, of just not work. Cause you know, I am kind of like oriented to like, want to like knock tasks out, uh -huh. yep. but it is more now just like, just constantly be working and not really worry about, you know, getting everything put away and stuff like that. Yeah. I actually had the experience today because it's really nice. It's like 75. You, your, and sunny. your daughter's how old? Our daughter's, my daughter's five months. And uh, so, which is really fun. Once you get to like four months and they can like, they, they have per, their personality starts to come out and they start to like, she will now smile pretty, has for like probably two months now, like will smile when she sees you. And like, there is nothing that like explodes your heart more than just yeah. having her look at you and smile and going like, I like you enough. But the one emotion that I've got, I'm going to use it on you. Yeah. Uh, but today it was like 75 and sunny in Iowa. It was like it was a little windy, but like she fell asleep. We have a swing just out back, and we just she just fell asleep on me while we were out in the swing. And just you get to like nothing else in the world matters when she's asleep on you. And like I try and leave my phone away from me as much as I can at home when I'm just with her. So like phones inside, I have no means of communicating with the outside world. I'm just sitting outside, birds chirping. And like she's asleep on me, like the world is great. Like I don't give a shit that I have done nothing professionally today. Yeah. It's, that's the things that like uh, that's the good stuff. Yeah. Um, is, is she your first? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, for some reason, I thought you had one already. No, I'm just I just look like I'm 40. Steel. I'm not actually <laughs> that old. I just look like I'm really old. Like it's yeah. the, it's the bald thing. Yeah. So, you're, you're you're still in California then doing the towing. So what is a day? Well, let's let's go back a week before before your your child was here. What is a day in the life? look like for for steel jans it's uh it's really routine oriented um am i absolutely shocked by that steel <laughs> in, in what way because i'm kidding because i no knowing you obviously we haven't talked in like a decade or so but when i did know you you, you were 
I feel like yeah. you have been a, a routine oriented person. But I think we all were because that's just yep. the nature of being a football player. He had to be. Yeah, he had to be. I think I was so used to that that I just carried that forward. And so I just naturally do that same routine every day. Um, just get up early every day, you know, get up at six. And so where I live, it's like we have an apartment and then we all part of the apartment is a shop, a full on like automotive shop with bay doors and everything. And there's an office. And then outside, there's a tow yard with a bunch of cars. So it's a full on industrial situation. There's business hours. So people are here. We got 20 or 30 cars at all times. And so so you're kind of like when every morning you just get up, eat, um, organize, clean a little bit and then just get ready to go. But really, the phones just start ringing and you're just kind of dealing with things. Um, the schedule is kind of like the lifestyle of being like a fireman where you're you're waiting because we respond to emergency calls uh, primarily. So it's the California Highway Patrol, the police agencies and the sheriff. And so you're on a 24 seven phone availability. And in the meantime, it's just maintenance, uh, cleaning the trucks, just deal fixing stuff, equipment, um, getting the, the junk cars uh, to the scrap yard or fixing them and selling them. Um, and then other than that, and there's a, it's a, it's integrated into life. So it's, I don't really have like a, a nine to five at all. Like I'm just like, I'll go to the store randomly and eat randomly and try and work out randomly. And it's so it's, it's very similar to being like, you know, as a fireman, you'll go like do like a 10 day stint at the fire station. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that, but it's like, Oh, it's just every day. So like the place I'm living now, I've been here for like, a year and a half and i've i've literally towed every single day since i moved like i haven't done one other thing like because it's 24 7 so uh -huh. and i just had i just got an employee recently um hey congrats man what yeah was so, you? what it was just you running the show was this yeah, so for was the first year it was, it was a whole big it was a whole big transition to get this new place to get the contracts to get the trucks and you're trying to do all these things at the same time um, juggling all these things and there's like stress to it. Cause you got to fork out the money first before you have like the guaranteed contracts. And, and so anyways, um, I had some catching up to do. So for like that first year and a half, basically it was just my wife and I here and I was just running every single call myself with the, I had two trucks and then and we've just been building up some momentum now. So now I got another guy and, and it's perfect timing now too. Cause the kid yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is here. And so, um, yeah, just been going with it and um it's pretty simple though it's just like what i said you know you're just dealing with the shop and then other than that just trying to stay healthy and sleep. Now, was this a family business that you had before then like did was your family in towing and trucking like growing up yeah so we grew up down in la and um so i grew up in a t tow yard and so that's kind of what led me to just naturally do that um Cause I kind of already knew how to do it. Like when I finished college, I'd already in high school, I would like hop in my dad's truck and like run calls and stuff. And so, um, we did a, so after college, I was with my brother and my parents doing the family business together. But then about almost two years ago now, I just went my separate way with the new place, the new company where it was just my wife and I, and then, so now it's my wife and I and our one driver. And so it's us three and, uh, and then there are two trucks. So we're just a small outfit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's just what we're doing. And now we're just, um, you know, just keep grinding and, and probably eventually like try and get a house and stuff and just mm -hmm. do the next step, you know? Yeah. We've got three dogs here too, like junkyard dogs. And so that's it's, great. That's oh a lot of God. Yeah. What are, the, what are like uh, names and how old and kind of descriptions? There's, so we have two Mastiffs. Uh, one is an English Mastiff. Yeah. Okay, English Mastiff. Okay. You're familiar with English Mastiff? Right. Floppy, the, the, floppy the Drooly. Sandlot, right? Yeah. Yeah. But she's actually got, her name's Helga. She's kind of got like a genetic defect where her head is like smaller. So she's really cute. Mm -hmm. She looks like, <laughs> she's just like the cutest English Mastiff because she's a huge dog, but she's got like this little pointy, like Teeny, tiny head. Yeah. And she's just really sweet. Their demeanor is kind of like a Great Dane where they're just like real yeah. lazy and just, they don't. And then I have another Mastiff, a Cane Corso, which is an Italian Mastiff. Yep, big gray. Did you, did you crop the ears or leave them? I wish I would have cropped it. I, And I'm kind of against it for the like... Uh, you're cutting a dog's ears off. Like What? You're just like, you're cutting a dog's ears off. Yeah. 
But um, he got into a fight with the pit bull when he was young, and the pit bull ended up ripping part of his ear anyway. Mm. But it kind of, now he's got like a little notch uh, in his ear. But anyway, oh, uh, Holyfield dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or I don't know if you ever saw the Disney cartoon. It's called Oratigan. It feels like something that I that my wife would know because every pop culture reference she has is a Disney movie from like well, it was our generation. It was like early nineties. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Nope. It was like the rats were like animated. But anyway, West is about as far back as I go. <laughs> the sidekick of the of the the bad rat was this little bat with like a peg leg, and he had like a he had a notched ear, and that's exactly what Merritt looked like. <laughs> it's, it's like this notched ear. So his name is Merritt. He's the and the Cane Corso breed is like the most impressive breed. I mean, they're like so smart. Uh, they were originally so they're Italian. They're originally Roman war dogs. Like they go back like thousands of years. There's like you can find history books where there's like illustrations of them all like armored up and they called them like limb rippers because they're insane. <laughs> if you've ever seen one, you would understand yeah. why they would be called a limb ripper. Yeah. But they're just highly intelligent. They actually went in st uh, extinct for a long time. And then in the 70s, in like Turkey, they found like one or a couple and then they brought them back. So it's kind of a crazy story, that whole breed. Yeah. They were gone for like thousands of years. The reason they were gone is because they were killed off by the people who took out the Romans because they were part of the Romans like army. Mm -hmm. The people who are missing limbs probably came back for. <laughs> yeah, the people. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then Snooky the third dog and all the dogs. The third dog's just an old pit bull. He's the grandpa. He's just like eight year old. Uh, name his name's Gouda. Gouda, I love that. Smoke. He's the wild card. He's the one we have to keep away from people because he sometimes if his brain shorts out, he'll just bite someone. You know, and that's so cool. <laughs> that's what you want. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what you. I guess if it's a tow yard, you have to have at least somebody that's going to be on patrol. Yeah, and a a pit bull named after cheese is really yeah. <laughs> that's the guy you want. That's really holding down the fort. They actually do hold down the fort, though, because theft is a big problem with towing companies in general, uh -huh. even in our area. But we've had zero break-ins because of the dogs. Like, mm -hmm. no, we leave them outside and stuff. And so they're an integral part of the towing company for, for sure. sure. Do you pay them a salary? <laughs> no, they do more salary than... is food. <laughs> <laughs> food and snuggles. They don't um, know they're working. <laughs> is is uh, with, the with the towing company, because you're like, what two and a half hours east of the bay area so yeah. like more inland northern Cal northern california yeah that's really pretty hilly mountain country isn't yeah. it so yeah. like our, as a lot of the highways i would imagine are like two lane highways yep. not this big six lane california interchange no. so it's it's mostly just two lane stuff through the hills mountains and like yep. logging roads right yep yeah like the roads is there's just towering pines everywhere if you guys have seen pictures or videos of it's it's literally just Tahoe. Like it's the same. We're 50 miles down the hill from Lake Tahoe. And so we're just up in the Sierra Nevada as we get snow. And um, yeah, it's just forest. It was, you know, the Nevada City and Grass Valley were just gold rush towns. Mm -hmm. We're on Highway 49, which is like the Golden Highway. I mean, uh, Coloma, where gold was first found in 18, was it 1849, I think? 49ers. Uh, yeah, the 49ers. Yeah, that's just down the hill from us, too. So it's I mean, we're in gold country. And then after the gold was the logging boom. And so um, just this area is just a uh, it's just a, a rich history of just mining and logging. And then mm -hmm. after that got all shut down, um, it became uh, starting in like the 60s. And then since then, it's just grown more and more. It's just like a nice place to live because it's just great weather. Um, we get a ton of sun, but we also have a ton of water. Um, mm. Really, mm -hmm. more Southern California. It. Yeah, yeah, like it's a very as far as area. Dry. Yeah. No, it really is. Yeah, because it's just you in a lot of places. You'll have like if you want a lot of sun, you got to go to like Arizona. If you want a lot of water, you got to go to Seattle. And there's not much in between. Um, but this is one of those places where just the climate is just perfect because we got the mountains close to the ocean but we do get a lot of sun you know we're relatively south yeah so, so still I've, I've seen some like crazy tow videos on like social media do you have any like, crazy stories like someone chasing after a car or like begging with you don't don't take my car yeah kind of we have i have a couple of those um because i do like repossessions every now and again um but not as much as like 
you know, if you watch like a repo show in like Miami or something or Atlanta, you'll get a lot more crazy yeah. than we did. <laughs> Um, our, we deal with just more crazy racks and stuff like s- stuff 200 feet down a hill and mm. gnarly accidents and stuff in the snow and oh wow um, yeah and it's a it's it's a small town but it's a really high traffic it's a super touristy here and you know and so there's just a, a huge volume of cars coming through here and people all the time and so um it's kind of cool because it's like we're not living in the city but we are able to make good money with the towing because uh-huh. there's so many people coming through and the roads are pretty treacherous, you know, I was gonna say, <laughs> which yeah. is good for a tow company. I was going to say, yeah, yeah it's pr- good pr- for a tow company. Guys. Yeah. Like there's five companies just in our little town, oh, which well. is absurd for a town this small. You know, there's only Nevada city and grass Valley are conjoined basically. And there's like 12,000 people in each town. So it's, they're small towns. Yeah. Um, but there's way more people coming through, you know, we're kind of a main artery the way to, highways are and then i-80 which goes out to iowa it's the same 80 is is just 20 miles from me and so we're just right on that main artery of, of highway 80 right as it goes through the mountains and so um that's why there's like a lot of tow companies here so you could hop on i-80 and just get to iowa then so yeah, yeah. If i was driving to des moines i just go out to the 80 and never get off yeah so when, when <laughs> you just think... make one turn yeah <laughs> just stay on the same road yeah for 30 hours yeah exactly <laughs> when when do you uh think think maybe that that trip could happen i think uh potentially relatively soon i mean relative to the fact that i haven't been don't out be lying to us. don't be lying to us deal don't don't no, be no, no, i think because you know i got the little girl now so she gets older um it's for me it's gonna be it would be more fun as like a family thing you know mm-hmm kind of show the family and stuff. And so um, I think I think within the next couple of years, you know. I think you'd be blown away too by all the the renovations that have happened. Um, just to, to football alone, they're also building something called Town in between um, Jack Trice and Hilton, where it's going to be like a little district, if you will, of, of buildings and, and bars and entertainment districts. So yeah, I would say if you can get here in the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean, if you get, it was like a couple of years that the Town will be done. So yeah, yeah, just wait, don't come at least for another couple of years. Don't come during construction. Yeah, don't, don't come. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's fine. Like the stadium is so much different. Yeah. They've, uh, press box is still tiny. Cause were you there when the, when the South end zone got bowled in? No, it was yeah. grass. Cause it was, it was the grass hillsides on yeah. both sides. And then I think it was the year that this is before 2013. Cause your last season was 2012. Yeah. So was before the 2013 season, they bowled in the South end zone. I might be having that wrong, but then they also completed, the indoor practice facility and the new locker rooms, which they've now demolished those and made new, new locker rooms. And then this whole performance center that goes on top of that. So like the football complex is so much different. Like it feels, it feels a lot more uh, high end. And I think one of the things that's kind of cool is, uh, and I don't know if necessarily it's like a goal of this show, but like getting stories of the people. Cause a lot of times like the cyclone fan base will talk about like it was, the Earl Bruce years back in like the seventies. And then there's like nothing until like the Dan McCarney years in the the late nineties, early two thousands. And they're like, and then Matt Campbell happened. It was like, Hey guys, we're, there's a whole section of time in the middle there. Um, And I think one of the cool parts is that like getting the, the bridge between being this sort of middle of the road, bottom of the road, uh, Iowa state doormat to be respectable across the country. It kind of happened while we were there and yeah. so like to get into the iowa state part why did a kid from socal choose to come to iowa state like why did you want to come to iowa state in the first place like what about it and was it herman or was it something else that got you to iowa state in the first place uh it was just at the well i was at a junior college and so it was really just came down to playing at the highest level i could so kansas state was I, I was supposed to go on a visit there. So that was really the only big 12 school. But other than that, it was just uh, San Jose State and Louisiana Tech and maybe a couple smaller ones. But um, but for me, it was just uh, Iowa State just came pretty hard on the recruiting. And um, who recruited you? Uh, Rhodes and Herman came out. Right. And then, uh, yeah, Rhodes went to my house. And, and uh, it was funny, too, because I'm sure he th- – I was in San Francisco, but my house is like three hours in the mountains from, so 
he went on this crazy night drive into the forest. And... <laughs> just living in a tree house. He has to climb. He has to actually like use like the rope and like start like a uh, spikes to actually like climb up into a tree. Yeah, like, it was pretty much like that. He really yeah. wants you to come to Iowa State. Yeah. Um, so, it, and it happened so fast. I mean, I was, I was playing ball in, at San Francisco. We were going to the state championship game. And then I, I went out to, Ames, like 10 days later, I moved out there. You went sight unseen, right? No, I went out there. For a visit? Uh, I went out to a visit, but then it was like a week later, I, I, I went out there. Okay. I went on the visit is when he offered me. And, okay. then, um, and then at that point, um, and because it was mid semester, I my window was kind of small on decision making. And everyone else was just kind of like, it wasn't as far along as uh, as Rhodes was where he was just like, you have an offer here. Like we want you to come right now. And so I was like, let's do it. You know? Um, and that's just it. it and two weeks before that, I never even thought of Iowa state, you know, it was yeah. just like that fast. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. I, I also, I think that time, cause that would have been the spring semester winter into spring semester of 2010. It was uh yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was 2010 was my last year at SF. And then December I went out there or first week of January and then into 2011. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember the first time my first interaction with you, and I don't know if you remember this because you met 15 other people every minute yeah. of every day, is you were wearing an Iowa State parka and just a gold chain and no shirt and like the, the training shorts and Tim's. And I was like, <laughs> oh. yeah, 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 it dude, was. That's very much I was a like, steel that's outfit. a very steel outfit. And I was like, all right, this dude's from California. He's a new quarterback. Let's go. <laughs> As we, it was Arnaud and Tiller and you. And like yeah. that was the group. And I was like, yeah. all right, we have. Tiller's from Texas, fine. Arnaud is an Iowa guy. He's got some swag, but he's not parka, gold chain, <laughs> Tim's, and training shorts. He's like, all right, this, this cat's different. All right, we're good with this. Let's do that. <laughs> so that was the first interaction. It was like, that feels like it's pretty on brand. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't remember that specific one. You know who I remember the most was um, when I first came out was Leonard Johnson for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> I was like with him the most in the visit kind of, and then just, uh, you know, and he kind of could like take up a room, you know, Oh yeah. Talking. So I think he was just kind of the life of the party, like for everywhere I was in the beginning. Um, but I just remember him early on. Who'd you room with when you got here? Um, it was, it was, uh, Sam, uh, the center, uh, Tautoloa. Yeah. Sa and then, Sammy Tautolo. Yeah. Yeah. And then Jevin and then Jevin it was us three. Oh, Jevin. Yeah. <laughs> who, who was the other one? Sam, Jevin, and who? It was just us three. Oh, and Freddie Court? Yeah. Hey, let's try double nickel. Yeah. <laughs> That's my Wally Burnham yelling at Jevin for no good reason. <laughs> that sounds like your, your Bill Blyle impression. <laughs> <too. laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> um, what, what would you say, going back to, you know, obviously Iowa State playing days, what would you say is like the most memorable, like your best memory of playing at Iowa State or just even being at Iowa State in general, not even necessarily playing? Um, man, what was the best? I mean, you know, the, the Iowa game, you gotta, you gotta say that just cause it was like the uh, overtime one naturally. Yeah. It was yeah. just so meaningful. And like, um, there's only a few times like in one's career where you get to be a part of a game. That's just like, like, I remember playing that game, but like, it was almost like, when it's that intense, it, things are just kind of happening. And it's almost like you're watching yourself make the plays in a uh, way. Like you're just yeah. like, okay, I just ran for 20 yards. Or I just threw a <laughs> touchdown. And, um, and that, and I had never, you know, uh, I had never experienced anything close to that before just playing small time ball high school and junior college. Um, so that's stuck, uh, stood out. Um, but other than that, I mean, I just enjoyed, I was always someone who enjoyed like, just the, the workouts and the practice and stuff like practice, you know, team at practice was always like just as fun for me as the game. Cause I was just that type of guy. Like I love just competing, you know, and I remember getting into it with like this, the DBs as we're getting a little too crazy. And, um, <laughs> a DB would never talk trash. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> never. <laughs> Leonard or Jacquez <laughs> would never talk trash. Dion would absolutely not talk trash. Yeah. I mean, there were times where we were like throwing the ball, like at each other's helmet, like me and Jacquez, like after the, like <laughs> I throw it at him and then I just get hit with a ball as I'm running back <laughs> to the huddle. Cause he's like throwing it. Um, 
but and those those times were always like in when those would happen in practice it would almost i was always happy about it because it made me feel like we had because like that competitiveness is like what it it took to win you know mm-hmm. so when you when we had those moments it was always like all right we got some guys like we're gonna go we can like take this out to on saturday you know and, yeah and sometimes practice was even a little more raw that way because in the game sometimes you're a little hampered by the the um you know like the script that we're on or the uh-huh. the, the down and distance or the the score can kind of hinder you a little bit where it's not as like wide open all the time but i really yeah. felt like being the wide open was like how we all played our best you know yeah. and in those moments when we were just i think we were a better team than our record indicated yeah, um, I, agree. I, I think that's but that 2011 team if i look back on it it was such a good like the talent mm-hmm. alone was and i don't even think we all even fully knew because we're in the in the moment you don't really know and you know, you're like, all right, we're Iowa State. We're not necessarily like picked to win the conference, or so you don't really know where you size up. But when you look back on it, and you got like, you know, Ko and Hayworth. I mean, those two linemen were the best two linemen in the in the league that year for sure. Yeah, and um, then you got Jake and AJ on the other side. Like, yeah, Aaron um, Benton, Leonard Johnson, like Darius Reynolds, is, athletically was more. He was better than anyone. He had a nice career in the in the indoor football too. Yeah. Um, and Lenz, so, and you got Josh Lenz. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, um, that was probably, I mean, just with those guys that, you know, KO Hayworth and, and Grant Mahoney and yeah, <laughs> yeah, Grant, yeah. Um, so I thought I did like, we, we, if we, if we could run it back, we, I think that that team could have been like a undefeated conference team for sure. You know? And all the losses were, as best I recall, most or all or most of the losses were close losses. And also, yeah. like with that 2011 Iowa game, I know that you don't really do any social media, or if you do, it's very minimal. Yeah. Uh, that game in kind of Iowa State lore is the Steel Jans game. Like it, it has sort of been, yeah, because of the performance that you had during that game. It's anytime someone refers to it, it's not the three overtime Iowa game. It's the Steel Jans game. So yeah. like <laughs> you have a game named after you. So you're yeah. talking about like the kind of that out of body experience of like, you're really just crushing this. And like, I, I know that I made that fade ball to money, but yeah. did I actually do that? Or like, am I watching somebody do that? And like a joystick of somebody doing that, like that, yeah. that game has sort of been your sort of, I don't know, legacy. And I don't know the, the question that like the Oklahoma state game thing. Like, I don't know if it, for me, it, it was, a, it took a while because I was like, I did other stuff too. Like someone, anyone would come up to me because I still lived in central Iowa and obviously you went back to California. Yeah. Like I still lived in central Iowa and people were like, man, I love that Oklahoma state game. I was like, I was there for five years. Like yeah. I did other stuff, but yeah. it took a while to kind of come around to the fact that like, if I'm going to be known for something, if my legacy is something, that's a pretty cool thing to be known by. And like, I don't know if the, the game being the steel Jance game, is cool as cool to you as the Oklahoma State game is to me that like it's a thing that people remember you by if you do nothing else on this planet. Yeah, no, for sure. That's why I mentioned it because uh, yeah, I mean, I probably harken back to, if I think back about the games, like I always think of that one first, you know, for that reason, especially because it was Iowa too, you know. Oh yeah. So, yeah. so you guys both have like like your games or like what you're known for. What what, what would I be known for? Fake um, did you have a game? Where you did like a I still think the Nebraska you gotta, game. If you gotta ask me that, it's probably not Nebraska. <laughs> it was a field goal game, Nebraska. Nebraska in O in ten. Yeah. No, yeah. He, he still on the bend there, but yeah. Well, yeah. actually, that their quarterback was the quarterback at San Francisco City College. Uh, Zach, yeah, was that his name? Zach Robinson. No, it was it was um it was Zach it was Zach it was uh. Wasn't just just ZAC though. Remember that ZAC. I think it was Zach Taylor or Zach Robinson. Something yeah, because like I remember he was at City before. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll go with the Nebraska game. Okay, <laughs> Nebraska game's the Mahoney. Did they have like a bunch of fumbles that game. There was eight turnovers. Eight turnovers. And Dominican Sue blocked a, a, a field goal and a, and a and a PAT of mine. I had like a fifty. I don't know two yarder in that game. Dominican Sue is a freak. Here's if a, you ask them, they would probably say Iowa State didn't win, but they lost the game. Oh, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> for, sure. for sure. Nebraska fans would absolutely say that. Great game, though. 
because it was a low scoring too. Because nine to seven. Nine to seven. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the another thing that I I'm just super interested in because I I was in Coach Pope's meeting rooms and Coach Pope's meeting rooms were just it was a big happy family. Like I loved being in Coach Pope's. Re- I still keep in touch with Coach Pope. I'll text him every once in a while. He'll text me six days later as if he didn't just like his responses are like, oh how you doing? Like just as if he responded right away. Like he does. There's no in his mind, there's no gap over it's those a, it's six It's a new days. conversation. Uh, but anyway, so it was always like, now yeah, he's got to get your head up here. Now just make sure you keep your feet down. Like, it's all very nice. Herman's meeting room, I imagine, was way different than that. Like, yeah. what was a, Her- a Tom Herman meeting room like? Because I feel like, which first off, uh, you can swear on this podcast. Go for it if you need to, because you can't tell a Herman story without. Uh, and second off, that man, between him and Yancey, there is no one who is a more proficient aficionado of the F word than Tom Herman or Yancey McKnight in ways of ways of using that word that I've never heard it used before. Tom Herman can do it more than anybody else. So what was a Herman meeting room like? Because I, I just I love these stories. It was well, speaking of Coach Pope real quick, uh, I remember I always just talked to him about Barry Sanders. Did you ever talk to him about him? Oh, all the time. Him and Javorski Lane and Ladanian Tomlinson. He coached all three, three of those. Did he? He didn't. What about Eric Dickerson? He coached. He was at. He was at SMU with Eric Dickerson. Yeah. With okay. the, the Pony Express. Yeah. He was at TCU with uh, Ladanian Tomlinson. He was at Texas A&M with Javorski Lane, the three hundred pound running back. I've got a story. And he was Javorski. At, and he was at Barry Sand or with Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. State with Barry Sanders. He yeah. was at all four of those places. Four and potentially State with Jeff Woody. Also there, uh, but he was some of the like four of the potentially the, like the greatest running backs, three for sure of. Five. Okay, not anyway. Uh, but like that dude has such a history. Like, if you want to get him stories, but yeah, Barry Sanders stories, he'll give it to me all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I used to ask him, like, mess with the other running backs and be like, so, like, in front of Sean Trell, I'll be like, so how does he compare to Barry? And Pope would be like, man, <laughs> he was like, can't compare to Barry. <laughs> but no offense awesome. to Sean Trell, but Barry Sanders <laughs> is probably the greatest to ever do it. <laughs> yeah. Sean Trell didn't think it was as funny. <laughs> Um, now Herman's was, uh, it was pretty tense. A lot of the time there was some, it was a tense meeting room a lot because he always felt like he was on the hot seat. Um, I remember before he went to Ohio state, he was, every meeting was kind of prefaced with like, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be getting fired. Like he, <laughs> no way. He, yeah. Like he thought he was like, so <laughs> it was just a, it was a tense, it was a tense meeting room. It really was. It was. Um, you know, he was just under so much pressure from himself mostly. Uh-huh. Um, because he like he knew he knew what he was doing. He kind of he cracked the code at Rice. He had like a really prolific offense. And he like there was always this sense like he couldn't figure out why he wasn't cracking the code for us, like why we weren't just scoring 50 a game. And um it was almost like it was there was a lot of like uh paralysis by analysis going on where because he, he was under that self pressure so much but he was also under pressure from roads and everything wow. you know um uh and then that would kind of bleed out to the to uh you know Maringer and then the tight end coach and sometimes the other guys that were in there um and at that time uh Messingham was the receivers coach yep so, I mean, yeah, we were – most of the time it was pretty tense because we the offense really wasn't uh, performing like we wanted it to, you know. And mm-hmm. so the, the overall was just always like, all right, like we got to figure this out. Um, and it was – it got so analytical with the X's and O's and so many – but to, to the point where it would get too f- – it would get too far away from – the reality of what you could actually do in the game. So we would have all this stuff. We went over all these different formations, all these little tweaks, but then the game would come and we're, we're running like 42 read and chains every play. (laughs) And like, it was all that, like, and it was like, he couldn't, there was like a leap that we couldn't make, you know, where it was like, um, so that was the, it it was really that whole year. It was just kind of like, we got to figure this out, you know? And, uh, you know, we were in it with him too. We were all trying to, and he wasn't really, he wasn't like cussing us out or yelling at us mo- at all. You know, we were all, we were all just kind of in it together, you know, trying to figure it out um, and, and just figure out how to use our personnel and, 
and use me too. I was a new quarterback. And so they, he was also learning, you know, cause I would do things in the game good or bad. And then the next week that would kind of be like, Oh, okay, we'll still kind of does this good. So we'll kind of go this way or that and stuff. And so, um, but there was a, you know, it was just, it was pretty tense and it was, I don't want to say dark, but it was, it was serious. You know, yeah. like, it was like, we felt like we, you know, <laughs> yeah, to like figure it out, you know. Yeah, that's, that's so that's so different from our meeting. Room. So different than ours that's too. So different, like the because the the kickers, punters, and long timers, we'd meet in Coach Rhodes' office and we'd metaphorically dump out sand and just draw plays. Yeah, just dicking around. Oh, this this fake might work. Okay, you guys want to go hang on the couch? Like we're done here. And you know. yeah, like we had to do our film homework, so we had our laptop which is like a $10,000 like laptop that weighed like 40 pounds. Cause it could add, so, it had so much memory. It was like every game from every angle in the last like five years of every opponent we played and the amount of film that he wanted us to watch was like insane. Like it was like, there was no way we could watch that much film. And so all, all the quarterbacks were coming in saying we had to skim over most of it. Cause it was, it was four hours of film a night. And I mean, we would watch, like whoever we were playing, it was like watch every game that that team played last year on defense. And like it was like <laughs> on a Monday night, and it was just it was out of control. And then, like I said, like we we started to see how in the games, it would just always go back to like kind of the same thing we were running no matter what. So we realized that there was like this disconnect on like how much yeah film we were needing and studying because none of it translated it. We, we essentially were just running like the same ten plays in the game. <laughs> just give money one. Just give money one of these, and then uh, just a little hand signal. Just throw it up to him. Yeah, All right, yeah we're good. We're yeah. good. Hey James, we're gonna run eighteen. Just pitch it to James White and just see what happens. Yeah. The next, you know, what got real wild though is the next year with Messingham, because we kind of like Messingham. There was a similar vibe with Mess where it was his first year as the OC. He was feeling the pressure. He was kind of taking Herman's offense, but also kind of bringing his own knowledge to it. So it was like this hybrid idea. But um, and it just kind of almost became a free for all. Like we started doing like it was 2012. We were like the first team doing RPOs. And that came pure. It came totally organically. Like I was going off script of what we were. were what I started doing was because we had to point out who to block on the yep. replay. And then I just, Thank you. Appreciate that. I just started giving the slot or the tight end Ernst. I'd give him a hitch or a slant instead of the block. So I just said, and then because the he, the way the teams were, teams figured it out how to do it. They knew if it was a run read, that outside linebacker would just shoot in to because he knew there was going to be a block there. Mm -hmm. So, and that's that's why RPOs developed to counteract that defensive scheme where. When they when you have somebody crash, yeah, either backside they, linebacker or the front like side rerun, line. they crash, and so that just happened organically, and that just became what we started doing. It, I mean, we just started doing it against Tulsa, like completely just one play. I noticed he kept coming down where the end would crash, so I would pull, and then the outside linebacker is right in my face, and so I just started giving a hitch, and then I would just pull it and just hit the hitch, and that started just happening in different ways too, where we were just kind of. And I was getting in trouble a lot for not listening and we, I would have to get scolded at in film for like, because sometimes it wouldn't always work, you know, but there was, there was a couple, there was a, there was a couple plays where, I mean, against the year before against Baylor, uh, we had a touchdown to money where he ran a post. And this is something I took from city college where when they played cover zero and it was just man across the board and they're uh -huh. bringing seven, no safety. Yeah what we would do is we would just at city college, we would just have the uh, tight end, just stay home and block because the guy, the man on the tight end, a lot of times if the tight end would block, he wouldn't necessarily rush. So you pick up a free blocker and then the mm -hmm. man on the tight end isn't doing anything. And then you just run a post over the top and just throw a rainbow. And, pass. Just, and just trust the fact that your dude's faster and bigger than. Yeah. It's just a one-on-one, -on -one, but you have the whole football field to just lob one up. Um, and we had a lot of success at City College to the point where whenever we saw zero coverage, we were just always checking to whatever matchup I liked. I would just pick a post, whatever receiver, and then keep one of the slots home, just motion him in. And then right before he got back out, just snap it. So he was kind of right off the end there. Mm -hmm. And then you just pick up the extra man. 
And we did that at, uh, and that worked against Baylor where money caught a post touchdown. And then I remember Herman was like, uh, I don't know what that was. He's like, but it was a good idea. <laughs> uh, it, I mean, I remember the, and Baylor the next year too, we did really good that game. I think we won like 35, 21 or something. Uh, like Lawrence year. I think it was before RG three. It's RG three. No, after RG three, RG three my class. Okay, RG three was the we lost at Baylor. That that's the game I'm talking about where I threw that one to money. Okay, um, but then the next year they were good that the next the year too. Year. Yeah, that was the Florence year. That was before Stidham. I don't know. They had that receiver that was really good. Uh, he went or was to, it? Uh, no, was it the dude that is Josh Gordon? No, it was someone else. It was uh, remember uh, Kendall. Yeah. Kendall Wright. Kendall Wright. Kendall Wright. Yeah. Yeah. That dude was a burner. They had some fast receivers that year. Yeah. There was a, I loved, I mean, uh, ethics aside with the, the Baylor program from like the early 2010s, I loved their offensive scheme just because everything yeah. was so wide open. And that's basically what Tennessee does now. Like with yeah. Josh Heupel yeah. is they put a wide receiver three inches inside the sideline and you have to respect yeah. the fact that like, and they just get a quarterback who can throw it 500 yards to the fact that if they're going to run a vertical from one yard off the sideline, you have to respect it, which means your corners have to be way out there, which means your safeties have to play either really far back or really far out. So I get a seven man box no matter what. So I can run really well. So like that, I just yeah. love that yeah. offense, but yeah, I don't know. How can a, they were a pioneer? Yeah. yeah, they were really the pioneers of a lot of, of that. I don't know who their OC was during that time, but they, they really, started that whole uh wide open spread the whole field and just kind of the run and gun depending on uh -huh. what they're seeing you know and just get super fast receivers not necessarily the biggest guys but anyway yeah so the next year with messingham it was just a lot of uh it was just a mess kind of like we were just it didn't even matter what we were watching in film because it was just like <laughs> Sandlot football at the game. It was just like telling guys to run a five yard out and like, you know, maybe do six yards because we needed a little more room. UConn, UConn was that 2011 or 2012? 11. 11. 11. Senior year. Because I was thinking that the, the, the full Steel Jans experience was the UConn game, whereas I think you, you had three interceptions in your first four passes and then followed yeah. up by winning the game and throwing yeah. like, I think, three more touchdowns after that. So like, yeah. that was the full Steel Jans experience where you're going to get some. You're gonna get some bad, but the good that you're gonna get is insane, and that's yeah. that's the fun the fun ride with the Steel Jans experience. Those interceptions were like so fluky too. Like one of them was like DD at like it was a deep Jerry start for the listener. Yeah, it was a deep fade, and it just like it tipped him, and the other guy like tipped and bobbled it, and then like caught it before he fell out of bounds. And then at one was to Hammersmith where it like tipped his hand and then it just went straight to the other guy. And then I forgot the other one. And cause I remember Rhodes was like, after the third one, he's like, what is going on? And I was like, these are flukes. I was <laughs> like, these are totally flukes. Like those were good reads and like pretty good throws, but it just like fluked out and like landed to the perfect guy. Um, that game is where I messed up my foot. I, I'm pretty sure I broke it that game. Cause uh, I remember it got stuck under Hayworth. He like stepped on my foot. Oh, it's a big roll. Right that's, a, that's a lot of, lots of lot of feet I, stepping on a I foot. I got tackled and I couldn't get my foot out. And it was like a slow <sighs> motion. And, I, and then I do, it was just like crack. And, like, and then he helped me up and I was like so mad at him. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but he's hard to be mad at because he's Hayworth. <laughs> he's just the sweetest. I remember Hayworth, the fun, well, I mean, one Hayworth story. I remember he was, uh, it was a fall camp. I don't remember if it was 2012 or 2011, um, but it was we we're Field of Dreams, still in the Olsen building. And we came back and it was one of those like mid-August days where it's freaking 800 degrees and humid and whatever. And everybody was getting cramps. Well, and I remember Jeremy Reeves would have to be on like, yeah, you know, like an, a permanent IV. He's got no Dar body fat. Darius Darks. It, 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 both of them. Like they have no full body, body fat. Full so body they have full body cramps, which a full body cramp is as it seems it would be as painful as you'd think yeah. so i remember hayworth was in the locker room and he started to get a hamstring cramp and then he got a quad cramp because he like was straightening his leg out so he had both a quad and a hamstring cramp and he went and just like punched like just to kind of like get a, a quick little i don't know relief of tension like Gah! and he it was like mr incredible 
and he just like smashed one of the doors to the locker, like the little keep padlock thing that you could like put your wallet and phone in, whatever. Like he's he cracks through one of those with just one crazy side punch. It was like, yeah, good God, that's like inch and a quarter thick wood that's mounted like it's like a six by six box. So that's like an inch and a quarter wood on a six by six box that he put his hand immediately through. And I was I don't, I'm glad I don't have to block him. I'm glad I don't have to deal with that guy. <laughs> yeah. They're good in his hand. No, but that's a Hayworth is so goddamn strong. Yeah, he, he really was. Yeah, I think I he had he have some of the records at that. Like, wasn't he like was he the strongest bench that year? Uh, is either him or Tufty? Yeah, it was them too. Yeah, yeah, those two. I think because it was Le, not Lamont because Lamont was done, but it was either Farniok. It was baby Farniok. This is his freshman year. Uh, but it was like he had Tufty on one side. He had Hayworth on the other side, and then he had KO all the way out on the other side. And then Braden Burris was the other tackle. So, yeah. like, I think Farn, all he had to do was just like get everybody in the right spot. And I think I remember him because they would talk about like Tom or Tufty would talk about it. It's like if they got confused on a read, if either Hayworth or Tufty got confused, Tom would <laughs> instead of calling like ace, ace or whatever, or calling out the number where the combination is to, to try and like leave some surprise for the defense as to where the blocks are going, Tom would just go like, Tufty, you and me, this guy to that guy, and just like point at him. God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Just, Tufty squats 800 pounds. I mean, just <laughs> let him move somebody. I yeah. gonna wait. He's going to make it work. Yeah. Oh, God damn Tufty. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Tufty. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Tufty. I went to his house. Say it again. I went to his house in Davenport. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's just north of Davenport. Yeah. Okay. It was. Because I remember we went to a bar and it was like right on the Mississippi River. Does that sound right? Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, way eastern Iowa. Yeah. It was like going back in time. It was like the 80s. We were like <laughs> driving like an old like. <laughs> Dude, that's Tufty too, though. Like he, I think, he, I think he's got to be at least like six or seven cars. He's like rebuilt from zero. Like yeah. just, the thing doesn't work at all. He'll replace the whole engine and just build a new one. Yeah. Un- unbelievable. I know his dad passed away, but that's I think his dad was into that into like car it was a car yeah. guy from what I, I, was, I was riding a car with tufty one time this is before push to start and uh we're in drive and tufty takes the keys of the car and he's like ha 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 i'm like well i don't know what's going on but he's like oh pull the gonna, keys out what of are the you car now i was like i don't know tufty is this car gonna explode like he's like no just put the key back in it yeah what the hell was that man <laughs> i was always whenever i was in a car with tufty i'm like no like i'm give me out i'm out i don't know what's gonna happen in his pickup, he had like a couch in the back. I used to ride in. I'm not gonna... I, okay, I remember that. Can I? I, I want to do a true or false story here. So I remember there was a Tufty told a story, and I don't know if it was Tufty or someone Tufty told somebody who told me. I, anyway, can't the source was Tufty at some point. And so you would because did you live at the Grove? Yeah, so like you would Tufty drop you off from the facility to the Grove, which is not very far. The Grove is right over by cold water. If you're if people aren't sure where it like aims geography. And so you'd just ride in the back of a couch or a pickup and it had like a little, uh, like a, a, one of the arms could lift up, but there's like a little storage container of something in there. And there's mm-hmm. apparently like a little whiskey bottle in there. And mm-hmm. on the way to, it was two minutes and there was some like, probably, I don't know, not a, a, a reasonable volume of whiskey in there. And Tufty was like, that son of a bitch finished it in the time from the facility <laughs> to the yeah. Grove. Is that true? Did that happen? <laughs> Yeah, because I remember drinking honey whiskey in the back of his truck, and I don't know what we were going to or from, but... Mystery I'm solved, like, everybody. I'm so <laughs> glad that that's true. I wanted that to be true. I'm so glad it was. Yeah. That's awesome. Steel, yeah. is, it, is it true that after the um, the Liberty Bowl, which was your final game at Iowa State, you have not been back to Iowa since? You went right from Memphis to California? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Did you make a pit stop in Hawaii at some point? Were you, were you living in Hawaii at some point? Yeah, yeah. And... So the way I left, the way I left Iowa, I kind of did that at every place. Like when I left San Francisco, I never went back. And before San Francisco, I was at University of Hawaii. That's how I got to San Francisco because the OC at Hawaii was was uh, Nick Rolovich, who was the head coach at Washington State, and then he got fired uh, during like the COVID years at Wazoo. I don't know if you're familiar with Rolovich, um, but anyways, he was my OC at Hawaii. And then, but he played at San Francisco City, so that's how I ended up at San Francisco because I left Hawaii. Um, so I, the way I went down was high school to Hawaii to San Francisco to Iowa. So it was three colleges, yeah. Gotcha. And all drastically different college experiences. Yeah, I don't know why names seem pretty 
pretty much the same. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, except in the winter. <laughs> Steel, is it true or false that at some point in your life uh, you have played the flute? Yeah. Yeah, I grew up in, uh, I grew up playing orchestra with my brothers. I, my older brother was violin and my younger brother was clarinet. And so we would get dropped off like every Thursday at the orchestra practice. And and uh, we did that for years. We got pretty good too, because we did it for like 10 years. Do you and still it, play? Could you still play? I can still play. Yeah, I could. I, I actually played like last year and I noticed I was a little rusty, like uh, not necessarily playing, but just reading the sheet music. I was uh -huh. surprised. I was like, whoa, like I can't. <laughs> Before I could just read through and play, but uh -huh. I didn't really realize you actually get rusty reading the uh -huh. music. Um, but it's a, it's one of those in flutes, not a, it's not like guitar it's, or violin. It's pretty simple well, you know, it's just the, the notes are just a certain sequence of your fingers. And then once you figure out the blow pattern, which most people can figure out in like five minutes, it's pretty easy. But you have to be really cool. Like Terry Crews plays the flute and yeah. you gotta be really cool to play the flute. Yeah. Me, uh, there's a funny story. My brother, cause my younger brother was in. Can, can you, can you tell us what your, what your brother's names are as well? The older brother's truck, uh, but no C, just T R U K. And then and Brogan, not a nickname. No, no, that's his. That's his birth name. name. Yeah, okay. and then Brogan is the younger name. Which, and didn't Brogan play somewhere too? Yeah, he played at uh, Sioux Falls. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought that. Yeah, I thought that Brogan played a, somewhere reasonably, and because he's three or four years younger. He, no, he's only two. Two. Okay. He played right after he played at Sioux Falls in like thirteen, fourteen, I think. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Wait. continue your story though. No, I was, uh, it was funny. We, uh, cause we were like the kids that totally didn't belong in the orchestra. Cause we were just like ball player, you know, brothers that, uh, and then the orchestra is all these like straight A student, like classical <laughs> trained. Most of them were like Asian and it was like very well to do families, you know? Uh -huh. And, and my mom would drop us off in our big suburban 454 engine, you know, with like total like battle wagon. <laughs> but we would uh, she would drop us off early and it was at Cal Lutheran uh, College is where our orchestra was in Thousand Oaks, which is where Coach Herman played football huh. when uh. he was in college. So he was playing there as a receiver when I was a little kid playing flute orchestra at the same place. <laughs> so we were we were crossing paths on campus. We just didn't know that someday he would be my OC and I yeah. <laughs> playing quarterback for him. But we used to I used to sneak the football out of of the car when my mom dropped us off. I'd put it like in my shirt and back away. And then <laughs> and then Brogan and I would go on the football field at Kalu and just start playing like one on one. Like you just get the ball in the middle of the field and then just try and get to the end zone. Uh -huh. And the, he was smaller than me, so the rules was I had to tackle him, but he just had to two hand touch me, you know, because he couldn't tackle me. Good other good good older brother. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of, except I was I was it usually like when he would win, I would just start beating him up because he was. He was <laughs> and so there were so many times where I would beat him up and he was crying and he had like grass stains all over his face. And then we'd be late to the orchestra because <laughs> before we know it, it was like 45 minutes had gone by and we'd only been dropped off 15 minutes early. So we had to get in there. So I would go sneak in there and get up to my little spot and just act like I was late and try and wipe off the sweat. And then like five minutes later, I would see Brogan come in and he'd be all like dry tears and like going <laughs> grass stains. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then he would have to like, of course he was like, he wasn't as good as, as my brother and I. So he was always messing up on the clarinet. So then as we were playing, the, the conductor would single out where the problem was coming from. And it was always from him. And so he would just got done getting beat up and crying. And then he was getting like singled out to like try and play the notes he couldn't play. And his, uh -oh. it was Poor for man. years. Yeah. But to his credit, he never, he never, uh, he never didn't want to keep doing that. Like the next Thursday, he just wanted to play again, you know, even though it was always ending horribly for him, he just kept coming out and playing. <laughs> so, <laughs> Poor guy was going through it. He really was. Yeah. Little brother syndrome, man. Yeah. That's He's getting kicked around. Yeah. Oh man, I don't know if I have anything else for Steel. I don't know. I, this is fun. I just good to talk to you. Yeah, again. I can talk to you for another yeah, hour, man. It's like we never stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> fun. Uh, I don't know. Is there anything for good? Anything else for the good of the cause? Is there anything else that like you like? What questions do you have about 
Ames slash Iowa slash Iowa State football um, in the in the year since you've been gone? And or I don't know what else. You, what do you have questions of? And do you still talk to any guys from the team? I really don't. Uh, let me think. What an uh, what an yeah, the last time I talked to anyone was was when I did uh, the podcast with with uh, Aiden and Corey. Um, yeah, no, I don't really talk to anyone. Um, no, I, I don't really have any questions per se. You know, how, how far are you from uh, like Napa Valley? Uh, about an hour and a half. Okay. Yeah, my parents go there a lot. They they're like super foodie. And yeah, so yeah. they're like part of the wine wineries members and Ooh. off the charts food. Like, I mean, you're talking like the best of the best. It's insane. The, that area down there for food is like it's it's like second to no place in the world. It's super uh, like the restaurants will it'll be like a fixed menu. So you mm, don't even go order. They tell you what you're eating and it's like a prepay like six hundred dollars to for two um the restaurants have like their own garden in the back of the restaurant where they're the salad you're eating was like just picked like half hour before it's on your plate uh -huh. have, i mean it's another level the fish and everything and so they're all into that i'm not quite at the point of being able to afford all that lifestyle so i, I was gonna say I'm, I'm trying to get out there and, and and yeah do some eating and some wine so it's gonna hitch up about yeah. that. i'm not sure my my pocket's that deep it's it's a great there's so many places and it's just a it's a it's not like a city where you there's like a downtown and all everything's right there there's there's all these little there's calistoga and healdsburg and uh santa rosa and napa and sonoma so there's all and every little town in in sonoma county just has like epic food and wine and just beautiful it's yeah i mean there's a reason the, the like richest people in the world are all out there you know yeah. a lot of times at those restaurants you'll see like you know famous people and stuff like that and yeah have you told that. anybody famous uh i haven't i got a tip from i got a secondhand tip from justin bieber i towed his he was at a hotel in tahoe and the guy who worked at the hotel got a tip from him and then i that guy broke down and i towed him right after and he gave me the tip from justin bieber to me and I kept it too. I still have it. It's like a little envelope. And it was like, <laughs> and he had like an alias that he used, like Justin ah. Bieber. He didn't use his real name. Uh, and it was like, Justin Bieber. It was something different. Yeah. So Steve Rogers. Um, Andy Samberg. Um, I didn't tell him, but I, I physically bumped into him in a, in a coffee shop. I'm, I go to, I really like coffee. So our town yeah. has like nice little coffee shops, you know, uh -huh. it's like a quaint little, if you ever Google like Nevada City downtown, it's like a, kind of like a little hallmark town all the old uh, victorian houses and oh cool there's cool little coffee shops so i'm kind of like a regular in the morning and stuff and sometimes you'll see people in there one time i bumped into him there <laughs> it was pretty funny that's great yeah dude but, that's uh, good, man. this has been fun i appreciate yeah, it yeah. 56 minutes worth yeah it's uh it's been too long we, we haven't talked in a long time so yeah we but we can do it again too say it again we can do it again anytime too yeah, I appreciate that. I'm now, sure. once once every ten years. Nope. Yeah, or or we can keep it. Yeah, <laughs> keep the mystique of it. <laughs> yeah. Let's <laughs> see. Once your daughter's going to college, then we'll yeah. actually we'll have that conversation again. It'll yeah. Twenty fifty three. Yeah. No, that's awesome. We appreciate your time, though, Steel. Thanks for thanks for jumping on with us. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll catch catch up later. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk again. All right. That was uh, that was Steel Jans. Uh, we told you it was going to be fun. Yeah, great guy. I mean, we could have talked for another hour. I mean, I, I, he said, you know, let me know when you want me to come back on. We're going to get him back on again. We're going to get back on. Yeah. I think it will be fun because he's got a unique perspective. Like a lot of times he comes across as just like, eh, I'm just here living life. He's actually a super sharp dude. Yeah, he is. And I would be interested like during the actual football season of just getting him invested into watching Iowa State football or an NFL game, like watching Brock or something like that, and then getting his perspective on the actual football part so people can kind of get a, a sense of like, this dude's actually got quite a lot going on up in his brain more than just like living life. Yeah, he does. Uh, he, I could also see Steele like, I don't know this. I'm just kind of going off. Um, just what I know about Steele. He hasn't watched football in four years. That would not surprise me at all. Yeah. So Wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we'll wrap this up, though. A little over an hour. That was an interview with Steel Jantz. 
like I said, we're going to try to bring on some more guests. Can't promise anybody, but we're going to try to get more guests uh, on during this off season. So we kind of have some evergreen episodes that we can play uh, just whenever. So thank you to all of our loyal listeners who are still listening. And as always, remember, adopt, don't shop.